Saint Paraskevi, the Parthena martyr, was born in a village around uh, near Rome under the reign of Hadrian, and this took place around 117 to 138 AD. She was born to two pious uh, Christians. Uh, her father's name was Agathonikos, and her mother's na name was Politia. It was known that both Agathonikos and Politia were for a long time praying to the Lord for the child. Um, they'd, been, they'd been trying to conceive for a very long time. And then finally, the Lord blessed them with the birth of Aya Pariskevi. As this great birth happened on a Friday, um, Agathonikos and Politia decided that the, the child should be named after the date of her birth, so they named her Pariskevi. Her education was thorough in both her secular and religious studies. She, she gained a great um, understanding of uh, philosophy as well as her deep uh, religious understanding and study of Christianity. Uh, she was ardent in her study of ortho orthodoxy, which obviously her parents had um, instilled in her. And uh, she, wanted to, she wanted to strengthen her faith in orthodoxy. That was her main objective uh, as she started to uh, mature. Whilst doing this, she also uh, continued to pursue her love uh, for other secular teachings as we discussed, philosophy, was one of her main loves. This kind of made a nice synthesis of both um, religious and secular studies. So she synthesized both her um, old world uh, teachings and her new world teachings, and she, became, she, she came to learn both ways of the world. Her beauty now was quite radiant. Um, she did not go unnoticed by many of the uh, well-to-do men uh, and uh, the families of those men around Rome. Uh, sh these families longed for her to marry their sons. Uh, she was really charitable, and this was a trait that was instilled to her by her mother, Politia. Um, she was quite uninter uninterested in these marriage proposals from the well-to-do men around Rome. Um, she was more interested in pursuing her religious uh, her religious teachings. Aya Paraskevi um, chose to pursue a modest life under Christ. Uh, at the time when she reached 20 years of age, she lost both of her parents. Uh, they died, leaving behind the fast family fortune. Again, they were very well-to-do. Well, um, unlike many other people at that time, she was unconcerned about the um, about riches and wealth that was left behind. She chose to donate most of that fortune uh, to those around Rome to help uh, the, less, the less fortunate. She did, however, retain some of that vast family fortune uh, to set up a, Kenof a Kenofian where other like-minded virgins could uh, study the life of Christ and, and follow the life and the teachings of Christ. Um, these women were like her. They, they prayed and they fasted and completed charitable works. These women preached to the many Hebrews and, there were, and the Romans and other Greeks that were idol worshipers, um, providing them with an opportunity to learn about salvation. Um, by the, by the time that she reached 30, it, she decided that it was time for her to move on and start teaching about the life of Christ. So she, she engendered to take on a mission to do this. Um, she walked through many villages and cities in an effort to teach them about uh, the life of Christ. This was at a time when Jews and Romans uh, were persecuted with severity. The emperor that ruled was Antonius Pius, and he ruled from 128 AD to 161 AD. And it, he was a little more uh, tolerant of the uh, Christians at this time, so he offered a trial prior to execution. Again, most of these emperors just moved on to execution. Um, 
there was no tolerance whatsoever of Christianity. Um, so he, he offered a trial and uh, in order to have an execution take place, if that was someone's desire, the, um, someone would petition, uh, another citizen would petition and make a complaint that in fact someone was practicing Christianity around them. So it could be said that Antonius, Pius Antonius was uh, protective of the Christian uh, faithful. However, during the time of the reign of Antonius, there had been many um, sort of disasters that occurred um, and were blamed upon Christians. So he felt great pressure to um, discourage uh, Christianity from taking place. Um, Paraskevi at the time was becoming more of a vibrant force. Um, she was very strong in her faith and learning and she spoke so very eloquently, um, which led a lot of people to um, convert to Christianity. They were so taken by her, um, by her um, love of Christ that they, they followed suit and they started reading the Gospels. When Aya Paraskevi finally returned to Rome, um, several Jewish Romans um, had lodged many complaints against her. Um, so she was summoned to Antonius's uh, palace to answer to him for these so-called crimes of practicing Christianity and spreading the faith. Um, at the palace, Antonius uh, asked Aya Paraskevi to renounce her faith um, and even promised that he would make her empress and he sought out her hand in marriage. Uh, at this point, um, he, this, I mean, this would have been a great, um, a great thing to ask of somebody and someone would have felt rather um, blessed by this uh, request. However, Aya Paraskevi certainly didn't feel blessed. She wanted to continue on with her studies and had no desire to get married to uh, the emperor. So to Antonius's great rage, she declined the proposal for marriage. Um, and this really enraged the gentleman. He became so enraged that he asked that he arrange for a helmet to be made with spikes inside of the helmet and it to be um, tightened on her head with a vice as punishment for her refusal to not only um, marry him but to uh, refusal to uh, discontinue her studies of the way. So um, this, this particular uh, punishment had no effect upon her. She did not feel any pain um, from this punishment and she came out unscathed, which was pretty odd to everyone looking around. Since nothing happened to her uh, due to this helmet with the spikes, uh, Antonius decided to throw her into a prison. So she, she was put there um, and at the time she was feeling all alone, she asked God to bless her and to help her and give her the strength to, for whatever was to come. Because it was certain that there was going to be more and more, um, more and more punishment coming to her. Now Antonius, um, likely seething uh, and um, just eaten up by jealousy, um, he ordered he ordered Aya Paraskevi to be hung up by her hair and, uh, and sort of hung above a cauldron full of um, hot tar and oil that was being boiled. And um, this was done and Aya Paraskevi was submerged into this cauldron of hot oil, oil and uh, tar and she to everybody's great disbelief um, was not harmed at all by the oil and tar and was quite cool um, despite the very uh, great magnitude of heat that was emanating from this cauldron. Antonius believed that witchery was being used uh, by uh, Agapadeskivi to keep the contents of the cauldron cool. Um, as Antonius approached 
well, you know, he decided to approach the cauldron to see what was afoot. Um, as he did that, there was ste hot steam and uh, some of the contents had bubbled up and spat up at him. Um, and at that point, it spat up into his eyes and he had become blinded by this. Um, so he panicked and did not know what to do. Uh, being in that vulnerable position, he asked out to Agapa Descavi and uh, asked her what, he th what she thought he should do. At that point, Agapa Descavi said, well, what you have to do is you you can there's only one way that you can be saved, and that is by praying to the Christian God. Well, at this point, he had no other alternative but to do what she had commanded him to do. So, uh, Antonius did this. He started praying to a Christian God, which he had never before done. And miraculously, he had regained his eyesight. Um, because of this somewhat miracle that he had witnessed, and others were there as well in his palace that witnessed this as well, he decided that he was no longer going to persecute Christians uh, throughout his, the great Roman Empire, not just in Rome. So um, Christians at this time were safe from persecution uh, until the very tail end of um, his reign. Now, this particular event is how Agapa Descavi began to be known as the healer of those with um, impairments of the eyes. Um, those that were blind or had some other uh, ailment were um, blessed by her and they would regain their eyesight. Um, the persecution, the non-persecution of Christians did not last long, however. Um, Antonius died in 161 AD. And around that time, coincidentally, a plague broke out throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, Romans themselves took it as a sign um, from their particular gods, whoever they were, that uh, the gods were angered by the, um, they were angered by the tolerance of Christianity. Under Antonius' successor, Marcus Aurelius, who reigned from 161, to 180 AD, the laws dealing with non-believers uh, were changed and the persecutions against the Christians resumed, unfortunately. Despite these dangers, Padascavi persevered in her missionary endeavors, spreading the word of gospel wherever she traveled around Rome or throughout the Roman Empire. By authority of the Emperor Aurelius, the, provinci the provincials Eparchs Asclepius and Tarasios captured St. Padascavi. Having refused Asclepius's demands to sacrifice to pagan gods, she was thrown into a snake pit. The saint made the sign of the cross over the serpent and the serpent perished. Asclepius had heard of the saint's previous miracles. Uh, and he realized that the great and mighty power guarded Parascavi and decided to set her free while Asclepius and his court were all converted. They decided, my goodness, we should all convert to Christianity because we've just witnessed the miracle here. Tarasios, however, was a little less uh, tolerant. Aya Parascavi was tied and beaten afterwards and imprisoned and uh, chained to a rock and, and another rock was placed on her chest. She prayed to Christ to help her be strong through this persecution. The next morning, Aga Paraskevi was taken willingly to the temple of Apollo. Everyone praised Tarasios, thinking that uh, he had succeeded in breaking her faith. But little did they know they had not. Upon entering the temple, the saint raised her hand and made the sign of the cross. Suddenly, a loud noise was heard and the idols in the temple were destroyed. The priests and idolaters dragged her from the altar, beat her, and pushed her out of the temple. The priest demanded that Tarasius kill Paraskevi. She was convicted and condemned to death by beheading. It was customary to give the condemned their last wish. 
She asked to be left alone for a few moments so she, she may pray for that one last time. Afterwards, the Roman soldiers returned and executed Agaparescivi. Many healing miracles occurred as a result of St. Paraskevi's divine intervention. It is said that, the, that merely coming in contact with the dirt of her grave, uh, if, if her faithful do this, uh, the crippled could walk, uh, the demonized would return to health, and the infertile would bear children. Her remains were eventually taken to Constantinople where they are venerated by the faithful to this very day. Um, she, be she came known to me because um, I actually have a grandmother who was uh, very pious and a, a very good woman who passed away um, in Brooklyn um, about the, before I was born actually at the age of 40 uh, from bone cancer and um, she was very pious and religious and a very good woman um, from what I understand. And uh, I figured that that had a lot to do with her name, her saint uh, that she was named after. And also my, my sister was named after her and she's a very good woman. So having this family history of women being named Padaskavi, I, I took some interest in her story. And as I st start to read and her history began to be revealed to me, it seemed like her story was one of, um, as you can tell by what we've just dis discussed, uh, heroism. Um, she certainly was the most, one of the most heroic uh, women that I had ever uh, come across, and she was quite literate at the time and didn't really care much about the vast fortune that her family had amassed in their lives. Um, those are all very interesting traits and, and quite heroic to me. Um, and I think that this is a story that um, the rest of the world should hear. Um, you hear about um, all these um, so, sort of uh, feminist uh, stories about very powerful women within history. Well, here is a saint who did some miraculous things. And um, certainly I think um, Christian women in particular can learn a lot from her life, as can Christian males as well. And uh, I, really, I really like this story. The feast day of Aya Pareskivi is celebrated on July 26, because that is the day of her martyrdom. Um, and on that day, observers uh, sing this hymn in her praise. Appropriate to your calling, O champion Pareskivi, you worshiped with the readiness your name bears. For an abode you obtain faith, which is your namesake. Όθεν προχέεις ιάματα και πρεσβεύεις υπέρ των ψυχών ή.